welcome. I can actually now say good afternoon. It is 12 o'clock Eastern on Thursday, December 14th. And welcome to our Vet Girl YouTube live event. Super excited not only to have my, my business partner here, Justine, my amazing friend, but also Dr. Rollins. Super excited to have Dr. Rollins here. We're going to be talking about obesity and orthopedic disease. Definitely a pain and super important in our field, right? I mean, I I saw a case the other day that, oh God, kind of reminded me of this pug that was lying down, overweight, painful. I mean, it just, it's so normal now to see that. It's its a little bit sad. That's why we're awesomely excited to have Dr. Rollins here with us. I can tell you, my name is Garrett Pactinger. I'm the co-founder of Vet Girl and also a criticalist. Looking out of my window, I am logging in from sunny Pennsylvania, a little bit cold, but definitely sunny. Justine, where are you logging in from today? Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Justine. I'm an emergency critical care specialist based out of St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm also a toxicologist and we are having a crazy warm spell. It's supposed to be 48 degrees in Minnesota today. So I'm already in flip flops. <laughs> Love it. And Dr. Rollins, where are you logging in from? I'm logging in from my closet. So I did not have a window to look out. It is quite sunny, though. Um, but I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee. Well, I, as, as Justine and I both said, we love your closet because of that amazing doggy background. It made us both smile as soon as we logged on. Now, you all know if this is your first Vecral YouTube live event, you may not, but others do because they're already doing this. Type in where you were logging in from, from around the country and around the world. We already have, let's see, Teresa from California, Caitlin from Tennessee, Sally from Reno, Gina from Calgary, Alberta. So yeah, please go ahead, continue to type in where you are logging in from as we get through our housekeeping, because we absolutely love to know where you all are. But let's get into the mix right now. First of all, you all know that we, when we have the benefit, the fortune of an amazing educational partner, thank you so much to Blue for being here with us today. With their generous support, we're able to provide this completely free race-approved event to the veterinary world. So again, thank you so much to Blue for all that you do and being a great educational partner. With that said, they allowed us to provide free CE. So how do you get your CE certificate? Well, there's two ways. One is you can take your fancy smartphone and use that QR code, right? We'll use your camera function on that QR code to fill out the form or type into your web browser address, tinyurl.com forward slash VG. And then today's date, which is 12, 14, 23. Justine will put that into the comment section in a little bit. We'll also show this later. Again, you don't have to do it right now. We're going to keep it open until 1 p.m. Eastern. So approximately 30 minutes after the session is over. And we'll remind you to do that later as well. As this is a YouTube live event, YouTube, you know, sometimes can give you that small screen. You can click that bottom right open box to make uh, your your uh, uh, YouTube screen, your full screen on whatever device you are using to maximize that real estate. So go ahead and make that YouTube full screen for you. If you're not a Vet Girl member, or even if you are, we certainly hope you're starting to become familiar with and use our amazing certificate programs. We have 13 certificate programs that are live, that are active, that are part of your Vet Girl membership. This is an amazing way to become more proficient in an area that you enjoy, whether it's ER, anesthesia, analgesia, ophthalmology, urinary disease, you name it, we have amazing certificate programs to truly level up and become more proficient in your desired areas. If you're not a Vecro member, check us out for completely, it's completely free for 14 days where you can look at anything on our site. Now, if you've been with us before, you know our style. We're clinically relevant. We're practical. We're cutting edge. We're unbiased. We love giving you quality education, but take a look at it yourself. We know you are going to love it. And don't have FOMO, please. Don't have FOMO. We want to see you in amazing New Orleans this summer for our next Vet Girl U event. For those of you that have been at our Vet Girl U conferences before, it is the bougie way to get your CE. And now you're going to be able to get your beignets, listen to some amazing jazz music, and do all the amazing things and, and see all the amazing things that New Orleans has to offer I would recommend looking at this sooner rather than later, A, because we're going to sell out, and B, early bird discount ends at the end of this year, at the end of 2023, and the prices will start to go up at the beginning of 2024. So definitely take a look at this. 
All right, I know you're not here to listen to myself today, technically, nor Justine. We want to hear from Dr. Rollins about nutrition and obesity and pain. So, Dr. Rollins, again, thank you so much for being here with us. If you can give our audience a little bit of a background of who you are and what you love to do, and then please take it away. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so my background's pretty straightforward. I am a lifer of the University of Tennessee. I was actually raised in Knoxville, so I did my undergrad, my vet school, my PhD, and residency training all here, and then I stayed on for faculty. So I am faculty at the University of Tennessee, where I've been here for about almost 15 years now. Also got three human children and one puppy dog, um, so they also keep me very busy in my spare time. All right, so we're going to get right to it and start talking about obesity and how that's related to orthopedic pain and how we can manage it. So to kind of set up this talk and let you know where we're going, um, first we're going to talk about how does obesity lead to orthopedic pain and disease. And then we're going to talk about how to do that conversation with pet owners. And I know a lot of us dread when it's kind of the weight conversation and, and how to make that happen. Then we'll talk about some of the barriers to weight loss success. We all know it's a very difficult thing to get our patients to actually achieve a, you know, a weight loss plan. So we'll talk about how to make it easier and then also just go into some effective communication tips for kind of long-term management as well. So I wanna begin with my own dog. Um, so this was my dog, Mabel, um, when I adopted her. She came into our practice from the shelter and she was relinquished because her owner said she just wasn't fun anymore and she couldn't walk, she had torn ACLs, she had all of the orthopedic things. And so we know there is a connection between obesity and orthopedic disease. And you know what we think of as the obvious one is gonna be those joint biomechanics, right? So we all know that extra pressure, also the change in the way the joints are gonna be oriented with the extra weight and the extra pressure, causes a lot of pain, ligament tears, you know, it's, that one's pretty straightforward, right? We all know that that's part of the issue. But we can also have arthritis occur in joints and be associated with adiposity and obesity, even if those aren't necessarily weight bearing joints. So when we think about humans, for example, um, obesity also contributes to higher rates of say hand arthritis. And so that's you know, not necessarily because you're putting more weight on your hands, it's because you have increased inflammation throughout your body that's also contributing to that systemic arthritis in those joints, even if there's not extra biomechanical pressure happening there. So this gets into obesity and inflammation, which I'm sure most of you have heard that there is a connection there. And it's actually quite a complicated connection. There's lots of different um, factors that are going into that. Um, so there's things like adipokines that are secreted from our adipose tissue. And those adipokines are kind of cytokines and hormones coming from adipose tissue. Those are often pro-inflammatory. Um, you also have a lot of inflammatory mediators that are being um, released from that extra adipose tissue. And all of that together causes systemic inflammation. So here's just kind of a very broad overview, but as you have obesity with larger adipocytes, um, you also are gonna have more recruitment of macrophages into that obese tissue as well. They come from the same precursor cells. And so oftentimes when you have a lot of more adiposity, those macrophages are also going to get created or attracted into that obese adipose tissue. And then you're going to have inflammation and that's going to be occurring again, because we have some of our um, hormones that are released from adipose tissue, maybe pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory um, like adiponectin. It's actually reducing inflammation, but the more adiposity you have, the less adiponectin you have. And then there's lots of pro-inflammatory cytokines that are released from adipose tissue. And so all of that increased inflammation contributes to the development of osteoarthritis. Another example, um, the most clinically relevant example that we have was a, a seminal study. Many of you may have already heard this study referenced or quoted in the past, but this was a lifetime study. Um, it was done by Purina where they took Labrador puppies and they put them in little pairs and they had one puppy kind of eat as much as he wanted to eat 
Um, and then another puppy ate 25% less than his buddy. And they followed these guys out for the rest of their lives. And what they found um, is that the dogs that were fed 75% of their buddy's food or 25% less had lower incidences of hip dysplasia. So you can see like 67% of overweight dogs versus 29% of the leaner dogs, lower incidences of osteoarthritis, 42% of the overweight dogs and 4% of the slender dogs. That's just at age two. And what I find really fascinating, just to, as an aside on this, the overweight dogs, they were not morbidly obese. They were on average a body condition score of 6.7 out of nine. So that's that's just kind of mildly overweight. So these are not you know, our, our most obese patients. So even that kind of being a little bit overweight at that young developmental age in these breeds caused tremendous issues with their joint disease. Once we jump ahead to age eight, um, higher incidences of osteoarthritis. And then at the end of life, um, looking at just hip osteoarthritis, 83% of our heavier dogs had it and 50% of our slender dogs. And if we look at overall lifespan, the heavier dogs, they were euthanized roughly about two years earlier than the leaner dogs. So those leaner dogs had a longer lifespan by a couple of years. And, you know, I also like to think of this in the context of, again, these weren't morbidly obese dogs. These were Labradors, which, you know, naturally have a little bit shorter lifespan than, say, a Pomeranian or a Yorkie. So I think about some of our toy breeds when they are morbidly obese. Think about how many extra years, I mean, years they can probably have on their lifespan um, if they stay leaner throughout their life. So um, pretty dramatic. This is the one that all of us nutritionists are like hang our hat on this particular study because it gave us so much information about joint disease, osteoarthritis, and the actual impact of obesity on lifespan. So I know I kind of already said this one, I'm gonna do it one more time because I just, I love this study. Um, but in the slender Labradors, they had a reduced incidence of hip dysplasia, lower incidences and in severity of osteoarthritis. They delayed their need for treatment of osteoarthritis and ultimately delayed their euthanasia. And of course we can't forget cats. Um, we don't have as many great studies or lifetime studies in cats looking at the link between obesity and osteoarthritis or degenerative joint diseases. But there was a recent study that showed that um, cats that were overweight were twice as likely to have early degenerative joint disease compared to lean cats. So it certainly impacts our cats like it does our dogs. So, we know it's a problem. We know that obesity contributes to, you know, we're just focusing in on the joints today, but of course there's a lot of other issues that obesity can contribute to, but then we have to actually talk about it with the pet owner. And I know that many of us really do not want to have this conversation. We don't feel very comfortable with it. You know, oftentimes we may have pet owners that are overweight as well. We as a veterinarian may be overweight and may feel uncomfortable talking about it when we don't feel great about where we're sitting either. Um, so it is just a hard conversation to have, but as medical professionals, we do have an obligation to at least state the problem. And then from there, it's really going to be up to the owner on what happens next, because it has to be a partnership. Um, everybody knows medicine doesn't work if we just, you know, berate people or make them feel guilty or we, you know, make them feel condescended to. It has to be a joint effort between you and the pet owner to make it successful. So I'd like to bring up um, you know, models of change, or this is the trans-theoretical model of change. And in human um, health fields, we think about this one, the classic is for, say, to stop smoking. Um, and thinking about the different stages someone might be at when they're ready to make a change, um, hopefully a change for the better. But there's several stages, and these are not necessarily linear. It's not that you always have to go through every single stage. You can even jump backwards from stage to stage. But it is kind of thinking through and helping you just have an awareness of where your pet owner might actually be in their kind of readiness for change. So we have pre-contemplation, which is basically where they had no idea there was a problem. So that's your client that comes in and you say, Oh, you know, we've gained four pounds since last year. We're starting to get a little bit overweight. And they're like, really? 
I had no idea my dog was overweight. I thought they were perfect. So that owner is completely unaware of the need for change. And so pre-contemplation, you may be just building that awareness. The next phase might be contemplation where they're like, yeah, yeah, I know they're overweight. Ooh, it's going to be hard, man. I got toddlers and they're just going to drop food everywhere. Or, you know, my, I work a lot of hours and it's just, I can't take on anything else in my life. I don't know if I can handle a weight loss plan. So they're just thinking through the pros and cons. Like, you know, is my dog going to hate me? Um, or do I have the time to deal with this? Can I buy the weight loss diet? All of those things would be the contemplation phase. The next phase would be preparation. So they're like, I'm going to do this. Yeah, yeah, I want to do it. Let's do it. What's my plan? And so they're preparing. They're getting ready. They're going, they're buying the food. They came to your office. They're, you know, getting an automatic feeder if that's what they need for their household. The final or the next phase is going to be action. So now they are actually doing it. They're in the weight loss plan and they are actively going through the process. And then the final phase might be maintenance, where they're now trying to integrate it into a long term change. Because we all know, especially when it comes to weight management, whether for our pets or for ourselves, you know, we can do it pretty well for a while, but eventually it's going to get hard to sustain if we don't find ways to make it easier and make it part of your overall lifestyle as opposed to a temporary change or a temporary fix. So what does this look like in practice? Um, I think, again, as medical professionals, we do have the obligation to at least state that there is a problem because it does affect the animal's health. How you state the problem, it can vary. Um, some people like to use humor. Um, some people like to be very matter of fact. Um, I think you can state the facts without having to use descriptors you might be uncomfortable with. Um, so may not want to, you know, walk in there and be like, wow, you know, fatty, fatty, two by four can't fit through the exam room door. I, I probably wouldn't go there. OK, but you might say something like Fluffy's gained two pounds since her last visit and she's now overweight. So all of that is very factual. Um, or if it's a patient you've never seen before, so you don't have a weight history, it may be something where you say, you know, Fluffy has a body condition score of eight out of nine, an ideal body condition score for Fluffy is five out of nine, you know, would you like to talk about it? So then the next thing you move to, once you've stated the problem is ask permission and ask if the owner is okay to continue that conversation. So would you like to discuss ways we can get Fluffy to a healthier weight? And this tells you a lot by their answer, right? So certainly I've been in an exam room where the owner was just like, you know, I have had a vet tell me my dog is overweight every year. Every time I come here for the last five years, they always talk about this. And I just, I don't, I don't think so. I think we're great. Well, honestly, you're not getting anywhere with that client. Like, all right, that's shut down. That's probably not a client that's going to move through all the stages of change in that one visit and be ready to make a change. Another client may respond very differently with, oh, wow, I had no idea. Thank you for telling me that. Well, yeah, what do I need to do? I want, I want Fluffy to be as healthy as she can be. So by asking permission, you're not coming in and being, like I said, the condescending doctor or the doctor that's, you know, putting a lot of judgment on them. You're just saying, would you like to keep talking about this? Um, and I think tone, of course, is important, too, to not sound judgmental, but to just sound honest and open about where would you like to go? And then based on their response, you can assess their readiness for change. And like I said, if they are just not even in that stage where they're ready, this may be the first step. Maybe next year they will or the next visit they will, but you may not get there in the first visit. And that's OK. You've done as much as you can. Like we have to acknowledge, of course, that we're not going to get everybody on board to do a weight loss program. But hopefully when you have one that is on board to do a weight loss program, um, a few things that will help make the plan generally work better. First is they need to be specific about your diet plan. Um, owners, it, they want you to tell them exactly what to do um, when it comes to the food itself. Because if you say something like, well, you know, just take what you're doing and, you know, I don't know, just cut it back by half a cup or something. I, they don't feel like, number one, that that's specific to their pet. Or if you say, ah, just cut it back by 10 percent. They're like, I don't know. My dog eats a quarter or three quarters of a cup a day. How do I cut that by 10%? I can't do the fractions, things like that. It's, it's difficult. And they want you to tell them exactly what to do. So give them a, a specific plan. Tell them how many calories. Um, tell them exactly how many cups or even ideally grams if they'll weigh it out with a kitchen scale. Um, 
I know that's every nutritionist's favorite thing is to have people weigh the food. And I, I know it's probably a losing battle, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, but that would be great if they would weigh it out. And they also need to know what to feed. Um, so be specific on what you're telling them and what you're recommending for their diet as well. Another important thing to make a good weight loss plan is going to be to make it as frictionless as possible. Okay. Make it as easy as you can. There will be changes. There kind of always is, or we wouldn't be in the situation we're at to begin with, but try to make it as close to what they're doing as you can, or to look for barriers right off the bat. But think it's like, um, you know, is it a cat that eats only dry food? Well, I'd probably make a plan that includes dry food. I wouldn't try to put them on an all can diet. if They only eat dry food because we know how cats are. They're not going to change. Um, I also like to look at the diet history to know how important are treats to this household. If it's something where the dog is just getting like every treat known to man and you know they're getting like 90% of their calories from treats, well then in this new diet plan, we need to talk about, you know, can we replace the treats with kibble and use kibble as treats? Or can we talk about, hey, let's keep the treats to like 10% or less, but you've got to incorporate them. You can't be like no treats ever because um, they're just not going to follow it. Also looking at, are there other pets in the household competing for food? That's a big one, especially with cats. Um, so I think sometimes some automated feeders are really helpful for separating animals, things like that. So try to make things as close to what they're already doing as you can. And then go ahead and ask them, like after you've made up a plan or, or while you're talking about the plan, say, where do you think this will be the most difficult for you? Are there barriers you think that are going to be in your house to make it harder? Like I said, maybe the kids dropping food from the table. Maybe they have a parent that lives with them that has dementia and wants to feed the dog all the time. So think through, you know, where do you see the problems going to um, arise? And that way you can try to troubleshoot it before they even get started. And that's going to help quite a bit. And then I just put up here the standard kind of weight loss program I work through in my head. Um, you know, it's a short, short presentation today, so I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, but, you know, basically you need to kind of come up with your goal so you can set calories based on your ideal weight goal and then choose your food. Make sure you tell the owners how much to feed of that food. And then we need to, you know, ideally get some kind of activity or enrichment plan, I think is helpful. And then monitor. And honestly, if you if you skip steps one through five, if you will at least monitor them and reduce the food accordingly, number six is actually the most important part. And probably the part that we do the, the worst job at. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, another tool I did want to throw up here for you is the Pet Nutrition Alliance Calorie Calculator. So I know private practice is busy. You guys don't have a whole lot of time for this. So it's a good resource because you can go in there and throw in your patient's current body weight, body condition score, um, a couple other things like their spay neuter status, and it will spit out for you weight loss calories. So to go ahead and just tell you how many calories does that pet need to kind of start a weight loss program. So that can speed up the process for you. So I highly recommend you guys use that as a good tool as well. So once you've gone ahead and calculated um, the other things using that Pet Nutrition Alliance calculator, moving on to monitoring. So Typically, I like to check them about two weeks after you start the plan to see if they're going too fast or too slow. Ideally, we want that rate of weight loss to be roughly about a half to 2% of their body weight per week. If they hit that spot, then we say normally we can kind of check in monthly after that if we're you know, not going too quickly or too slowly in the beginning. And I also think telemedicine is a great opportunity for weight rechecks, um, especially with cats. I think that can be a big barrier for a good weight loss program as people having to catch their cats and bring them into the vet's office um, could go for dogs as well. So I think it's a good opportunity with weight rechecks to maybe see if they have a scale, like they can buy a baby scale at home, especially for cats and little dogs, or they can come to your practice, of course, but if there's a, a more convenient scale at the you know pet store or something like that for bigger dogs, but you can use telemedicine as a great way to check in. As long as you have a body weight, you can kind of determine, are they losing too quickly, too slowly? And then you can troubleshoot or just give support. Sometimes our clients just really, especially with weight loss programs, just really need to hear an add a boy or an add a girl, or a, I know you tried real hard. Maybe we didn't lose anything this time, but keep going. We're going to do it next time. So 
definitely utilize some telemedicine as a, a really efficient way to make this happen as well. And then definitely use your nursing staff. I, I can't iterate this enough. I think weight loss programs and those rechecks, this is what your nursing staff is made for. Um, so you can charge for some of these weight um, nurse rechecks, let them take the lead on it. You know, as long as the patient's losing in an appropriate rate, then, you know, then they're good to go. And they can always come and check back in with you if something's off or weird. But this is definitely a great way to utilize your technicians and your nurses um, to use this in a busy practice and, and, you know, use it as a way to also garner some income and things like that for your nursing staff. All right, we all know weight loss programs are difficult. So a couple of things to also walk, walk through with our troubleshooting. So the first is our multiple cat households, right? We all know that that is like the hardest when you're trying to get cats to lose weight in these multi-cat households. Um, so I had a study come out last year looking at some automated feeders that actually separate cats um, based on collars and tags. And we did find those weight loss programs were more successful and owners definitely thought they were easier and more effective. So I would highly recommend that if you have pet owners that can do that. Some will use microchips um, to only allow certain cats to eat. Some will use collars so if they don't have a microchip or they can block others. Or you can also just use things like um, thinner cats might be able to jump higher up onto like the washing machine than the overweight cats. Maybe you put the thin cat's food on top of the washing machine and the heavy cat can't get there. And things like that, but ways to separate the pets are going to be really important in those multi-pet households. Other things to think about with begging behaviors is sometimes you can maybe put their food in a room you don't go in very often. I think a lot of us feed our pets in the kitchen and we go into the kitchen all the time. So every time you go in the kitchen, the dog or cat's like, oh, where's my food? Where's my food? Where's my food? But maybe you put it in, say, the uh, the powder room or the, you know, guest bedroom, if you have one, not that anyone has a guest bedroom anymore, but you know, if you have a room you don't go into very often, maybe you feed them in there. And so they will beg when you walk in that room, but you only go in that room maybe once or twice a day to feed them. So that can help with some of that annoyance. I absolutely love feeding toys to put their food in. So I'm, I'm a big fan of not even using a bowl, especially if they eat dry food, um, put all of their food in a toy. Why would they just you know, they need to hunt and forage and be active when they're thinking about their feeding. So snuffle mats, anything like that. Um, I'm a big fan of just not even using a bowl and put all of their food into some kind of interactive toy. Um, you can also use things like timers. Um, the one at the top there is a um, one we can set a timer to have a meal release. So for the cat that wakes you up at like four in the morning for their food, maybe they get a little bit of food at four or five in the morning so you can sleep and actually have a functional life. So these are just a few things you can try to make it a little bit easier for doing a weight loss program. And then if they have a lot of treats, make sure we do incorporate those into the plan. We want to keep unbalanced treats, so things that aren't complete and balanced kibbles, to less than 10% of calorie intake. So oftentimes I'll recommend the dry kibble as the treat. Fruits and vegetables also give you kind of a lot of bang for your buck. And then also if the owner is really trying to give a lot of treats, Talk with them too about, you know, sometimes your pet really just wants your attention. So maybe instead of giving him the treat when he's looking at you, grab the ball, grab the toy, just pet him, just love him. Um, and they actually oftentimes are looking more for the attention than they actually are for the treat itself. So in summary, um, we know that obesity is a major contributor to the progression of degenerative joint disease. And we want to make sure that we try to inform our pet owners about weight concerns but also we have to respect their choice. If they do not want to participate in a plan, it's their ultimately their choice, but we do need to bring it up and we need to ask them if they want to do this with us. And then also make sure that weight loss plan is specific and tailored to the pet and the household so that we can preemptively troubleshoot, make it go smoother, and then try to maintain that communication throughout the weight loss program. Right. We are back. 
Um, I'm going to say we, Justine and I are back. Dr. Rollins, thank you so much for that awesome information. I mean, clearly it is a super common problem, unfortunately, that I think we all see in practice, whether it's emergency practice, specialty practice, and certainly general practice. We know the percentage of obese patients is in, in rising and concerning. So a lot of awesome, awesome information. Um, Justine did type into our little comment section. If you do have questions for Dr. Rollins, please go ahead and type them in. We'd love to get to a couple of them. Very briefly, though, we did want to go over a couple of quick housekeeping things. I know Dr. Rollins did go went, uh, go ahead and, and she went ahead and put her contact information there. So if you have any questions for Dr. Rollins after the fact, but we did want to remind you a couple of things. First off, as we said, be at the beginning, thank you so much to Blue for being an amazing educational partner and helping, helping to sponsor today's event that we were able to provide completely free race approved CE to the veterinary world. With that said, as a reminder, how to get your CE, we did go ahead and type that into the screener as well, that URL, that website address to click on and to go into, or you can use your fancy smartphone and that QR code. We're going to keep it open for another 30 minutes. So by 1 p.m. Eastern, we will close it down. But if you want CE credit and your CE certificate, please fill out that form. And when you do, please make sure you use your email address associated with your VetGirl account. We're going to match that up and put your certificate directly in your VetGirl account. If you don't yet have a VetGirl membership, you all should if you're on this page you can get one for free, at least a trial membership, if not a lower basic membership. So go ahead, please do that and make sure that email you use is your VetGirl account. With that said, I'm going to pass it to Justine, who will entertain some of our questions and I'll go through some more slides as she's doing that. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Garrett, you said it was dog wallpaper, but there are cats on it too. So oh, we don't want to forget totally all our right. friends. Yeah, right. uh, I don't, don't want to discriminate. I, listen, for those <laughs> yeah, that no, know me, no online discrimination. For those that know me, they know I'm actually a cat person. So I'm not I'm not going to discriminate. I'm a super friendly cat person, but you're right. And they're all wearing, are they all wearing glasses? No, not all of them. Some of them look like they're, you were, should they're just, sans glasses. You should also disclose but, his wife is an ophthalmologist, a veterinary it's true. ophthalmologist. It, it's yeah. true. This is why uh, if I took off my my, uh, my my virtual background, there's tons of eyeball things all over the place. And why I immediately picked up on this, I've been trained by my wife. Pets wearing glasses, that is cool. Exactly. <laughs> Dr. Rollins, that was amazing. I especially loved um, getting the owner buy-in. I love the tips that you had with the client communication. Uh, because again, it can be really awkward. And we know... and. Uh, thank you for pointing out that study, that longevity study, um, that 14 year study by Purina. Um, I use it all the time. We, we all want our pets, our dogs to live, uh, you know, almost two years longer. I'm just waiting for them to do the cat study on that. But um, so important to know that even the dogs, they weren't the nine plus on the body condition score that they were the, the six, the six and a half. And I think we all see uh, so much obesity. Um, thank you also for bringing up the pet feeders. Um, that's what I, in full disclosure, I use on my own cat. I use a whisker uh, litter robot feeder and um, I can feed up to an eighth of a cup and I purposely have it go off at 5 a.m. in yeah. the basement so I can't hear yep. it. Yep. <laughs> so I do really think it, it uh, helps so much with buy-in for the pet owners. Uh, we do have one question. Are you able to share the article or even the... Um, go back to the slide regarding the autom um, automated feeders for cats. And then do you have any recommendations to swap to low calorie food or do you keep the same food they eat, but in less amount, especially if the owner's compliant and wants to do, uh, we'll do whatever you say, which do you prefer? Yeah. Um, I'm happy to share the article. It was in the journal of feline medicine and surgery. I don't know if, if anyone wants to email me after I can, I can send it to them or the best way to get that out there, but um, yeah, happy to share it. Um, as far as changing food, um, of course, I didn't have time to go into it too much today, but really, you know, weight loss diets, the, the most important thing about the therapeutic prescription weight loss diets are that they are fortified with higher levels of vitamins, minerals, and proteins. So you don't get deficiencies if you have to feed a low amount of food. And for cats, I feel like you always have to feed a low amount of food. So I do really like using a therapeutic weight loss diet. Um, it's usually my preference, again, because they're having to be calorie restricted so much. It does have a lower calorie density, which is helpful for owners, you know, as they're making that change. Often it doesn't feel that different to them because of the lower calorie density. But for me, it's really about Oh, this high, higher levels of nutrients is why I care about it tremendously. But yes, generally, I will recommend that they change their food. 
And then how gradually do you have the owner do it just to make sure that, um, especially for cats, they transition over, like over, yeah. a, month, over a week? Yeah, about a week. I mean, you're, you're often dealing with a lot of fiber changes when you move to a therapeutic weight loss diet. So it takes a minute for the gut to get used to moving from maybe a low fiber to a higher fiber diet. But about a week is usually good for most most patients that don't have really sensitive stomachs. Wonderful. And then uh, there was a comment. How do you break the and I know you mentioned this, especially with the ball for dogs. But how do you break that strong association with pet owners loving their pets with treats? And in full disclosure, I do that, too. <laughs> but like, right, how do you right. have any tips with that? Um, I mean, there have been some studies suggesting that they actually tend to have a little bit more of a close bond to the the owner that plays with them than necessarily the owner that feeds them. Um, but I think, you know, tell them to give it a try. Like I said, you can use a kibble as a treat. Most of the time, if they're looking for attention, that's good enough. So you may be that they just don't get fed from a bowl and all of their food is just treats. Like that would be fine. It's not, there's no problem with that. So if the owner just loves it, That'd be the first thing I would do. And then I would also just explain to them that, hey, a lot of times when they're looking for a treat, they really just want you to like pay attention to them. And and owners may pick up on that a little bit too. And like I said, just a little rub with the head or a little pet, just a little attaboy. And they're usually pretty happy about that. Wonderful. Great, great information. Uh, Dr. Rollins, just wanted to thank you again. Also wanted to give a huge shout out to Blue Buffalo for providing this completely free to everyone. We know you're super busy. And I love the fact that we have so many people from all over the world, from Mexico to Portugal, to Canada, to all over. And we know you guys are super busy in the clinic being able to watch this while you're in between appointments or on lunch break, <laughs> if you have that at all. Um, so a sincere thank you for all that you guys do too, because I know life is crazy during the holidays. And again, please make sure to fill out this form. We just put it in the chat again, a tinyurl.com slash vetgirl or VG um, with the appropriate date. It will be um, 12 1423. And again, that link will close in about 30 minutes. So CE is only associated with watching this live. And uh, Dr. Rollins, just wanted to thank you again. Super awesome lecture. Love all the hints. Again, just because of the growing problem. And we really want to minimize that orthopedic disease. And with that, if you have any comments, feel free to type them in. Any shout outs or thank yous, we'll make sure to pass them along. Otherwise, we will see you at the next uh, Vet Girl event. And thank you all for all that you guys do. We only have one more webinar to close out 2023. Uh, that'll close us out with 150 hours of live CE uh, this year, not including the 1,000 hours on demand. Um, and again, thank you for all that you do. And with that, have an awesome day. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everyone.